Oops. Oh, it's here. I am literally can't read. Ah, oh, brilliant. Actually, you know what? Seeing this all together does make me feel actually quite accomplished. Hello and welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, with the new year, I thought it was very good to reflect on all of last year. Specifically, what I read in 2019. I managed to read 40, well my Goodreads will tell you 14, but I actually read 15 things because I read like, what, 300 and something pages of Brighthead Revisited in 2019, so it kind of felt weird to then be like, oh, I read it in 2020 because I didn't. I read the vast majority of it in 2019, and then it took, you know, it took me like, what, five months, and then like the last 100 pages I read in like what, two, three days, because I was like, I have to finish this now, otherwise I can't do this video. So I finished that for you. Well, I'll just plug my Goodreads to start off with it. I would just actually thank you guys for like being on my case about getting that because it has made my like reading experience and like keeping track and everything so, so much easier and so much more enjoyable as well because like I just enjoy like when it gives you a little rundown. It's like, you've read 2,000 pages. I'm like, oh my God, no way. How exciting. In 2019, I wanted to read 15 books technically I have done that if you count Brideshead, but that doesn't mean I read 15 novels. <laughs> if you're new, I am dyslexic. That would be impressive, but it is just not something I am capable of doing. I'm not capable of reading one, three, four and page book after another. I can't do that. Uh, let's mix it up. As always, I'm gonna put all of the books in the description. I will tell you my editions, my reference. Well, my challenge for 2020, I wanna read 20 books in 2020. Now that I really am in a place where I am not being assigned reading in the same way obviously that I was in my undergrad, I did comparative literature, I loved it, I adored it so much. So this is my way of like not letting that love die. <laughs> and also when you're watching this, I start film school properly on Monday. What I'm reading at the moment actually, because I bought it and then you guys were like, read this one, it's great. I bought three of like the short modern penguins and I put up my Instagram story at Sarcastic Fish. Um, and then I love you message me going, read the Camus, it's so good. So I'm currently reading his essay, Create Dangerously, to go with my whole like, oh, I got to film school now. Um, aesthetic, yes, we need to create a new aesthetic. That's enough waffle. Let's get on with these and I will talk through them in the order that I read them. So I'm gonna start with these two. I read both of these for Coblet still. It's kind of tripping me out that like, my last lecture was back in like, April or March. I should have read more. I've had like no like assigned reading for a very long time. So I read Thomas de Quincey Confession of an English Opium Eater. I will confess to not having read this entire thing. I very much skimmed through it. I read the bits that I had to. So like I did my best when it was required of me. This for me was low key boring. It's kind of autobiographical-ish, is it? I think it is. When it becomes 19th century London, I don't enjoy it. I love 18th century, you know, give me 17th, give me 18th. When it turns to 19th century London, I can't hack it anymore. There's something about that like Victorian sort of, I just, I don't enjoy it. I don't find it interesting. The same way that I never enjoyed like Jacqueline Hyde, for example, anything like Jack the Rippery, it doesn't interest me. I guess also maybe like my gaps of knowledge are larger so I can't like contextualize and fill things in. It just doesn't appeal to me in the same way. If that is your kind of vibe, maybe you would like it. There is meant to be like a connection with like, music as well, which was kind of what my module focused on. I personally will fess up to not seeing it. I mean, maybe on the album page, which you can literally say, see, it just says like, finally, because it's about opera. I would love to do a video about opera, actually. That has become a thing that I am just becoming more and more like in love with. This was kind of dull and I didn't enjoy it. So it's like kind of meh. I didn't enjoy the De Quincey. I, it's, the way he writes doesn't speak to me. Someone who is like a little bit more interesting. I have a soft spot for the romantics, okay, when it comes to the 19th century. So this was um, Foscolo, Last Letters of Jacopo Ortis. I read something else that was Foscolo, but I can't remember what it was now. Oh, it was Sepulchres. Sepulchres? Sepulchres? What is it called? Sorry, it's my ass. This, Sepulchres, which is like poems and stuff. I read this for like a British, like romantic Britain in Italy module. I actually enjoyed it. Basically, you have to almost consider um, Foscolo like the reverse Byron. So you have Byron starts in the UK and he goes to Italy and in Greece. Foscolo does the opposite. So he's buried somewhere just outside of London, I think. He, again, is, you know, it's romantic with capital R. It is very much like, 
you know, Goethe-esque and all that kind of stuff. I feel like they always get carried away and they're a little bit like overly emotional. Um, and that's coming from me. This I read for the French Revolutionary Effect, Germany, Italy, Greece, France. So just like how ideologically and like literally the French Revolution like changed everything. I actually wrote my essay. So I wrote a comparative essay with this and I used it against the Charter House of Palmer. It's a lot about like, yeah, he hates Napoleon and it's like happiness and I think about it like between like happiness and like the nation and stuff. I much prefer the Charter House of Palmer. This was amazing. If you want to read something that's like French Revolution, um, but like Italy and stuff like this, oh my God, it's so, it's so, I was in love with Fabrice. I'm just so in love with him. Oh my God, he's like such a romantic hero, but like in like, still like kind of like chivalrous kind of like, way instead of like a little bit pathetic which i think okay i do think romantic heroes can be a little bit pathetic um at times but i don't think for is like that but i do think false glows kind of like characters are like that you are liked you not so much banished from his homeland from the woman he loves jacob ortiz lives constantly with the insufferable feelings of disillusionment and betrayal jacob ortiz embodies the crisis of the revolutionary hopes of an entire generation and the death of an idea of freedom based on human trust and love so if that's up your street go for it. Again, I didn't enjoy it. Ooh. Ooh, my module should be written on the inside. Aha! This module was listening across the channel. I write modules on the inside of my books. It makes everything so much easier to find. Actually, I write my name, my institution, the module and the year on the inside of my book, just so I know where everything is at. What was next? Ooh, the decor. This was like a mind fuck on like another level. I don't know why they seem to insist on putting always like modernist, like cubism or like just any kind of shapes as art on the front of all of these like editions. A discourse on the method was, it, it was a lot. It was, <laughs> my brain was just like, fuck. You know, sometimes you read something, um, if you read like any philosophy and like, you have a, you know, your foundation of like who you are as a person and like all your beliefs and what, and then just sometimes you read something and it goes Z -Z -Z -Z, and you're like, fuck. I read this on a plane and the entire, like I don't think I looked up for the entire flight. I was just like, ah the whole time. I went, I quite, I very much went to town in this. It's not very long, it's like a hundred pages. It's just a lot of para text because it's such a dense text. So it's quite a long introduction. But I find this such an engaging text. Give yourself a decent amount of time to read it. Like it's 60 pages, the actual deck discourse. I really enjoyed this in terms of like reasoning and how like how you think as well. It's from this, you have the famous cognito ego sum, like I think therefore I am. It was just like fascinating. What Descartes is like, what, 16th, 17th, 16 something, which is 17th century, right? Yeah. Da -da -da. Sets out in brief his radical new philosophy, which begins with the proof of the existence of the self, next deduces from it the existence and nature of God, and ends by offering a radical new account of the physical world and of human and animal nature. Basically, if you want something to maybe challenge how you think and give you maybe like a new way of looking at things and exploring things, and it's only 60 pages, but it will that'll take it'll tell you a while in terms of like you read shit and you're like, what the fuck? And you need to read it again and again. I really enjoyed it. I actually can't recommend it enough. She was dense, but she was fun. I started having like, a, what was it like about the public and private self? I always like fucked with my brain like loads. Yeah, this really, really got to me. As you can see, I had a lot of thoughts. I was talking about like the self and then I was like, okay, but then where is the distinction between like the self, like who you are when you're on your own? Who I am, am I right now? Yes, I am on my own. Yes, I'm doing something that I'm very accustomed to, but I'm aware that other people are gonna see this. Am I a different self now than I am when I'm like on my own? Or am I a different self when I'm with my friends? Or like then, <laughs> Because you're always in a weird way a slightly different version of yourself. Is there such a thing as one true self if you're always being like different slightly? What does that even mean to be like the self? And then like your social media image and like, but does that actually mean that it's any less actually you because these are the things you are still doing? Yeah, you can see why this like took me for like a brain ride. I was like, oh my God. It's really, really interesting when you read something that was actually written pre-age of internet, but you read it and you're like, fuck, this has like almost never been more relevant. Actually, I'm doing that with a cameo at the moment. But he's basically talking about things and I'm like, oh my God, this is cancel culture that he's talking about, which is just like hilarious, but also like slightly terrifying to me because I'm reading, I'm like, huh. Descartes was also talking about like what you know for sure. You are thinking, see the only thing that you can then therefore know for sure is that you exist, but like, 
or can you? So, you know, we'll also think about the matrix a little bit. So that was also kind of there too. Um, so just really, really, really highly recommend it. I am so glad that I read this. It was for class, what did we have? It was for neoclassicisms, which is somehow a word I still managed to spell. Yeah, neoclassicisms. <laughs> and then I started extending this to the plane. <laughs> Basically, it's radical doubt that he's talking about. M uses radical doubt to calm herself down about the plane. What I know for sure, flights are safer than cars. That noise is the air conditioning. Turbulence is safe. Oh lord. I definitely wrote a lot about the private idea of the like private versus public self. Fuck it's here. I had thoughts. Who are these monsters who don't annotate their books? Miss Bitch just says, yo, I am tripping, my brain is frying. <laughs> yeah. If you want to think about the self, and if you like don't know who you are or whatever, like read this. It'll melt your brain and then you'll be like, fuck. Next up we have Rousseau. If you've watched me for long enough, you'll know that I am a deep lover of Voltaire. So reading Rousseau kind of felt like cheating. I was like, mm. But then also like, okay, you know, enemies, close, friends, whatever. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Reveries of the Solitary Walker. He goes on walks and then he writes his reflections. Not romantic, but it's like getting there. And it's also the idea of like, not just like seeing the world, but like seeing your place within the world. And he bangs on a lot about how all he kind of wants to do is go live on an island and how he was happy as there, where he could just live and just like carry on and do nothing. And how his favorite science, for example, is anything with the natural world and botany and plants. And the idea that with any other science, this is obviously talking like the 18th century, um, with any other science, you need people to teach you things and therefore you need to take their teachings as true and you cannot necessarily prove that they are wrong. So to an extent, you could be building your entire knowledge and philosophy based on something that is a lie, which in itself is like a really interesting concept. He likes plants and stuff because he can, you know, do all that himself. He doesn't need to take knowledge from anyone else or anyone else's opinions, beliefs, whatever. He can see everything for the first time and create his own conclusions and like build his own knowledge and philosophy and whatever upon what he himself has experienced. Oh my God, it was coherent for the first fucking time in ages. Brilliant. I liked it. I think it was interesting. It's like the last thing he wrote. I think he died. Reveries of a Solitary Walker is Rousseau's last great work, the product of his final years in exile. Blah, blah, blah. Part reminiscence, part reflection, enlivened by anecdote and encounters, the Reveries forms a kind of sequel to his confessions. Writing an account of his walks becomes a means of achieving self-knowledge and safeguarding him from the pleasure that others, he is convinced, seek to deny him. I enjoyed this. I think it was nice. I like the way that it's structured with the walks. You need to read one and then your brain needs to have a rest. And then you do need to reflect on what he says. And like, I think reading him do that to himself means that you kind of start to want to do that to yourself. That's what I like about when I read essays or like anything more philosophical or whatever, or anything about the way we think or the way that we look at the world. You always need to pause and you need to read it. And then you essentially need to apply it to yourself. I don't understand how else you can really read things that aren't fiction in that way. They're just trying to make you think about the way that you think and about the way that you see the world. And I really enjoy texts like that. So like, yeah, they're short, but fuck, they'll take a while and they'll take a toll on you. Like sometimes you'll have to put it down and be like, okay, that's enough. But I do recommend it. And I feel like there's something, like he, he kind of knew he was, he knew he was gonna die. Or like maybe he was just being melodramatic and then it's a self-fulfilling I mean, self prophecy, but I enjoyed it. And I wrote about it in my exam. I did all right in my exam, so I class. You I like but I really cannot actually recommend reading philosophy and essays enough. Like, I like them because I'm like, oh, you're short, I'll read you, I'll find you interesting. And then it takes a while because you're like, ow, my head hurts now. Do -do -do. Ooh, <laughs> what's next? Some of you have, may have watched Shannon Rose on YouTube. I read her book, her second book. So she is a adult actress turned YouTuber, but this is about her like porn days. And oh my God, it was, that, like, okay, Shannon is not the world's, you know, greatest author or whatever, but just, like, shit got real. Oh my god, it's just a very intense, like, journey, and I think that it's fascinating to see, like, considering where she's, like, come from, like, where she's gone, and, like, how she's doing now and stuff. I just, this was so intense to read, and, like, really fucking enjoyable. Like, some bits obviously are, like, super sad. You know when people are like, oh yeah, real life is much stranger than fiction, I think this is, like, an embodiment of that. Honestly, if you wrote this and said it was fiction, people would be like, that's not very realistic, that would never happen. She had an intense life, <laughs> like, pre-YouTube. That's actually quite funny. <laughs> I do highly recommend, um, especially if you watch her videos. For me, from, like, a storytelling perspective, like, I would, like, high-key, like, to make the film of this, because it is interesting, um, and she is just quite a character. She's a very colorful character. It's not a masterpiece, but it is very enjoyable. Ooh, right, my summer stash. Let's start with Mitford, because we know 
We know how much I love Nancy Midford. I read The Sun King. I've also read Madame de Pompadour. I've also read Herb Voltaire. There somewhere. And I bought Frederick the Great, which I'm gonna read soon. I read her biography on Louis XIV on The Sun King. Oh my God. She is just like, this woman, when she writes, it's like gossip central. There is just something so enjoyable about it. And I think almost to an extent is a more interesting, I can say interesting because I can't speak for accuracy, but I think it's a very interesting portrait of someone like Versailles and like at court in that way is because this is gossipy. It's very, very gossipy. And I'm like, bitch, spill the tea. And I feel like that would have been probably a very accurate representation of what being in Versailles was like. It's like, there's people everywhere. It's like, just a lot. <laughs> there is a standard book where he does tell you, you know, everything about his life, very less focus on the mistresses. He had a lot of them. Apparently there was one point where he was going to a battle and in, you know, in his carriage he's got two of his mistresses and the queen and they all hate each other. What kind of a man do you have to be to like do that? I think the only person who would do that is Louis the 14th because he can. And I also, cause I have a film that I wanna make on someone. So I feel like you almost need to start with Louis the 14th. Otherwise you need, you like you miss context for like later. When he got to the end of his life, you know, I've got succession secured, whatever. He had his son, his grandson and a great grandson within, oh my God, within like 10 days, his son and his grandson both, they all died very quickly. A lot of people of smallpox. So you've got Louis the 14th. Louis the 15th is actually his great grandson. So he was like five when Louis the 14th died. Can you imagine that poor kid? I just can't get over it. Like that must have, like no wonder he was Louis then, became Louis like the beloved. You can understand that someone must spend the rest of their life craving love and affection because anyone remotely close to you died. And also, because Louis the 15th, he was the second son. He was never meant to be king. And then everyone just kind of died in the middle. And then poor, 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 poor child. And Mitford always wants to like, humanize the people. She always wants to try and look at things in a way you can't accurately historically do, you know, like emotions and feelings and whatever, and maybe necessarily motivations for like how people act and like to each other and whatever. I enjoyed not having, it's not a military history. This is not a military history of like, oh, you know, we've done this campaign and this war and like this was, it's much more a look at maybe who they might have been as a person. And while yes, you can say that this is wishy-washy, she does argue many sides, many arguments, and I just enjoy it. I enjoy Mitford a lot. I really resonate to the way that she tells stories, the way that she investigates someone else's story and tries to tell it to you as faithfully as she thinks she can hundreds of years later. If you have an interest in Louis the 15th, 14th, Fuck, I always get that wrong. If you have an interest in The Sun King, but you don't want to read those like big beefy books that you know blokes have written because they're going on like a power trip being like, oh, I wish I was Louis the 14th. Blah, blah, blah. Here's all the military history. Um, Yeah, if you don't want to read that, read this. Don't know, I wonder how much of a difference it is because it is written by a woman. Anyway, that was so good. Can't wait to read Frederick the Great. I read Henry James. I read The American. I'm sorry. I'm trying so hard with American literature and it's just not working for me. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm doing my best. Again, like I said, you may leave your recommendations. I feel like I maybe need more contemporary stuff. I didn't enjoy it. It's 400 pages of me hating my life. It was so boring. It was really, really boring. Nothing happened. And you could have wrapped up the story in about 100 pages. I don't know why this is 400 fucking pages long. Nothing happens. Honestly, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Christopher Newman, a wealthy American businessman, descends on Europe in search of a wife to make his fortune complete. I think the female characters are weak. I think that Newman is kind of boring. And of course it ends with a fucking cloister. If you want to read it, be my guest. If you don't, don't. It was shit. I'm not going to dwell on this. It's an ancient house, but even though they're running out of money, they still don't want her to marry him even though he would fix everything because god forbid they marry an american god forbid it's new money it's that kind of like clash and i thought that would be interesting and gossipy and juicy but it, it managed to make something that can be so entertaining so dry just like there 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 i'm sorry henry james you were not worth the effort then i read do, 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 castle rack rent by maria edgeworth this was fun. This is like 100 pages, but it chronicles like the four last heirs of 
a fortune. Castle Rack Rent narrator Thady Quirk gives us four generations of Rack Rent heirs. Du -du 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 -du. So it kind of goes through the last four and like how they all fuck it up and how they all meet their end because obviously they only, you know, they have to die and like sort of the legacy and like what they do to the castle and what do they do to the fortune and to each other and yada yada. It is very caricature-y but it is something you could actually probably make a really interesting like four part series out of. Yeah, okay, let yourself fill in all of the like maybe like psychological like complex stuff like they're not complex characters by any means but it is very swift and very enjoyable in terms of like how shit goes down this is set in ireland in the 19 or 1790s maybe a bit earlier if you haven't read much of this era and maybe you want to like dip your toe in start with this very enjoyable very funny you knew women can be funny <laughs> Oh, I finally read it. I finally read it. Oh my god, this is fucking great. If on a winter's night, a traveller by Ito Calvino. So enjoyable at all my Italians who have been like made to read this and then were made to hate it as a result. I'm so, so sorry that they did that to you, but this was fantastic. I've never read anything like it. So it alternates between like the story, which is kind of like you, and then the like each time you read a different chapter so to an extent it's like calvino flexing on us being like look each time you're gonna read the beginning of a novel you really want to read the rest of but you're never gonna get to because he's just that good so it's kind of like well screw you guys you're actually never gonna read it but then you're reading the novel and it's just kind of like very meta in that way and it's very like you do this and you do this so the way he leads you through the story is like he's got hold of your hand is like come come with me so in terms of like that kind of engagement it's really really fun other chapter is like very Contem it's very like sat always usually like quite contemporary like a little bit crimey a little bit like investigate mystery investigative e but my brother read it as well he kind of said like that it feels each time like a book that you have already maybe read and then you don't get to read the rest of it this is a bit like his reading experience <laughs> but it was very good it's so engaging and it's so fun and one of the best things i have from is this the best thing i read all year if you look at my pile i think this is the best thing i read all year I'm gonna put The Sun King second though, because that was very good. So well done, Vintage, you are choosing your author as well. Really, 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 really highly recommend. You can't go wrong with it, especially if you love just books. Not even just if you love literature, but if you just love books, this is great. I wanna preface this with a statement of don't you fucking judge me. If you guys have ever watched Avatar, it's currently on Netflix. They have a comic book series. So they have like books, but it's like three parts. So that's why I'm showing you three things right now because it's part one, part two, part three. And this basically picks off literally where the um, original Airbender series finishes. So it is a continuation. It doesn't involve the original creator, so like, in other words, it is canon. The way the series is like shot and made translates really well into these comics. And like, you still get that same kind of feeling and it is just very like fun. And it was, it's almost like, even though it's trans, actually, even though it's transposed mediums, it very much feels the same and you do still feel very at home with it. And it's not like, you've turned it into a novel and then you're like, oh, I, it, you lose all the essence of what made the series really enjoyable. It continues to have the same complex characters. It continues to have the very same way of like how they tackle more grown up, more difficult themes, but in a way that is still like accessible for like kids to start like thinking about it and engaging with it like one of the th main themes at the moment that they're talking about in like this book is like decolonialization and like rapid decolonialization and stuff like that and occupation nationalism all that kind of stuff but they do it in a way that like is not in your face sort of like you have to think about this it's more like oh hey this is like a real life issue that is actually happening and this is how this is dealing with it and as always this show has always had such a strong moral compass and I've loved it so much for that and it's just honestly great. So yeah, these are fantastic and I really can't recommend them enough if you guys have fans of a show and you were very upset when Legend of Korra came out and it was shit. Read, read these. I have the next two of the next book here so I can't whip that at some point being like I want to look at pictures. Oh also I guess that's a tip if you have someone in your life that you want to try and motivate to read more and stuff give them comics if they enjoy the story, if they enjoy the sensation of then turning the pages and like of completing reading a book, it will help transition them better to reading like like denser stuff. And also they're just beautifully, beautifully illustrated as you'd expect. This did not, did not disappoint. Next, these two, I read these like a day each respectively. I bought this in my book tour video that many many of you have watched hello i read season sontags regarding the pain of others this is supposed to be a follow-up to her video on 
video to her um, essay on photography, which I really want to read, which I haven't read. But it's about how when you photograph someone else's pain, someone else's suffering, what does that mean? Should we do it? Why do we do it? What are the effects of it? She mentions quite a lot of specific photographs. I did Google almost all of them and it is very... It was a very interesting thing to read, especially like in my position. While I never actually film or like, you know, take pictures of anyone in a situation like this because I would never and it's not appropriate. So then obviously for me, the question of like, when is it appropriate and like what can and can't you take pictures of actually is an interesting discussion. One of the things she said that I found so interesting because it's kind of like really true is that, for example, in the West, a lot of the time, if you take pictures of someone suffering often people try to keep it anonymous maybe in a way that you can't see a face one thing she mentioned was like soldiers lying face down on a beach but then as the subject who is suffering gets less white how then their you know anonymity becomes less of an issue and i just find that like when she said that i was like oh yeah no yeah that happens um and then like why is it that we do that? And like, has anyone, have you noticed this? And then how people then talk about like, respect for the suffering, like, should you take these pictures? And like, does it matter? Is that, where does it become voyeuristic and all that kind of stuff? It was a very dense read. It was at times kind of emotionally crushing. And then she discusses a lot about like, okay, what is the effect about like, when pictures like that are actually staged? Um, should these pictures come with the captions? What about when they're captioned wrong? She was talking about like with the, Serbian and Bosnian uh, conflict about how apparently both sides were circulating the same pictures of dead children saying that it was the other side who did it so like when you have a situation like that like what do you even what do you even do with that you know and like how if things are even labeled wrong or whatever I found it eye-opening she wrote this in the 70s no she wrote, I think she wrote on photography in the 70s but then she wrote this in 2003 but like again this is all pre-internet, this is pre- well it's not pre-internet, this is like pre-social media boom. It's just be so interesting to see how she, and now, now that I'm reading the Camus, how they would like react to how we are, you know, doing this now. How easy it is to whip our phones out and take pictures of people in like bad moments and whatnot just because of the ease of it, the convenience and about, you know, the shit that gets likes and the shit that shocks as well, is what she talks a lot about. So I find a lot of this like theoretical stuff that then when you transpose it into like thinking about it right now with like social media, I'm like, fuck, it fucks with you. And it's very like, oh my God. So I really recommend this. This made me think, and in a social media age where we see so, so, so many images and a lot of pictures of pain and a lot of pictures of all just, I really, I can't recommend this enough. It's eye opening and at times unbearably sad. Next I read Henry Miller. <laughs> I started reading this first time when I was about 16, 17. I was too young to read this at 16, 17. Not in terms of it not being like PG. Henry Miller is the definition, it's just not PG. Just even the philosoph philosophical side, I was high key, high key, like too young for to understand it properly. Even now I'm still kind of like, do I? Am I ever going to? Is there a point in understanding? What do I need to understand? But Henry Miller just talks about sex. Can I help you? Miller is just interesting and kind of an asshole. Like, Guy is a douchebag. He was married, what, like five times, I think 10 years, a pop key cliff notes. I sort of wrote, huh, sex and death, self liberation, a game, tactics, desire, awakening, and journey freedom. I think it largely is about like sexual freedom and, you know, liberation and expression, which I guess to an extent is very relevant now, but I, you know, also do not think this is necessarily written for a woman. Being at a point where we have never been this. <laughs> we have never been so free to fuck. Um, it was just quite an interesting thing to read and then like reflect on like your own attitudes and your own approaches and things. Um, not like literal approach, wasn't it? There's no way I can take myself out of that one, never mind. Um, it was interesting. <laughs> I don't think this is like the most necessary thing that you ever need to read, but Henry Miller is interesting. So I kind of want to, I really, really actually want to read his um, Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. Henry Miller's bold, explicit novel scandalized readers and remade literature of the day. Somebody did not clearly know that Sard exists. I will one day, I promise, once I have acquired 
enough. I will probably do a video on like all of the like <laughs> literary porn I have because erotica. Um, because I think that would make for quite an interesting video. Because I almost can't make it without trying to philosoph 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 philosophize 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 it. You know, almost like you have to then justify it with philosophy in order to just by the fact that we all enjoy the porn aspect of it. Anyway, before I get demonetized, not essential, but if it's like your interest, interesting. Also, I was how to like align with them with all my feminist views, I was like, <laughs> right, okay. Actually, while I'm here, look at this cool notebook I bought. I bought it in favor days. Isn't it cool? Oh, I also bought the other side of my ego. <laughs> Oh my god, it's so funny, it's a Pomeranian and like a Bichon Frieza or whatever they're called. Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> yeah, I'm like a mature adult now, haven't you noticed? Um, right, and then the last thing I have read that I've technically finished this year, but we're gonna say that I read it last year. I finally made my way through Bride's Head Revisited. It took a while. I did read quite a few things in the meantime because I was just like, Meh. I liked this. But I think Sebastian deserved better. I really enjoyed it. I think the first like 200 pages are so like nostalgic and so like sort of like glory days and like, you know, oh, Oxford, oh, look at all her fancy, look how much money we are, look how fancy we are, look at our titles, look, big house. Which is very enjoyable and very like, you know, indulgent. But shit gets sad. Charles Ryder as a character is, he's, I think he is quite dense. And as well, like seeing him like, change but still like be the same person i think it's interesting because i think that's kind of hard to do and it's just funny how like nonchalantly he like skips over years of his life and like he'll like start with like a few sentences and we're like oh damn you got married had kids and spent two years in the jungle in that time what um that happened in like the space of like half a page so it's just interesting like seeing his like fascination with like first sebastian and then how it like gently goes to his sister julia Sebastian's sister. I don't know, I personally think it's sad because I just kind of always think that like him and Sebastian deserved better. I think at the end of the day, they deserved each other. No homo or not. <laughs> oh my God, I just fell so in love with Sebastian. His like descent and then like erasure is super sad. I'm like, oh, I think you should have gone after Sebastian maybe one more time. Okay, it almost feels like it starts like a warm summer and then ends in like a cold winter, which weirdly, ironically, now I've just said that is actually how I read it. I started reading it in the warmth of the Provence sun and I finished it in the non-existent London sun. I liked it a lot. I think I would probably reread it, but then only the first 200 pages then stop. I also kind of feel like sad when I finished it. It's the sort of book that maybe you do want to like jump back in and just like stay in that nice bubble which i guess because it is written like as a reflection you know revisited i guess to a way the nostalgia is very much the point we meet charles Ryder when he goes back to bride's head because it's being repurposed for like army training stuff so i guess in that like memory sort of sense you know looking at like his oxford years or like roasting his glasses and stuff like that is very much there i guess makes you look at your own life sometimes in that way. We all have a summer we'd like to go back to. I really enjoyed also just the, the book, the physical book, and like the font. I really enjoyed that. I really, really love this. But I'm sad and I'm almost struggling to let it go because I'm very much in love with Sebastian and he deserved better and that makes me super sad and I'd quite like to just go, f <sighs> he's the kind of person that you just wanna go like after and you wanna try and help and you'd only break your own heart helping them because the only person that can help them is them. And you're like, fuck, I really enjoyed it. Kind of makes me sad though. I didn't think it would be this sad, especially because the decline um, in the last few pages is quite rapid. And like the Catholic aspect of it, like simmers for most of it. And then sort of, it doesn't even like erupt. It kind of almost just like floods, like it, it by the end, like it's not, it's like a more of a drowning sort of being flooded kind of aspect rather than like a, exploding shit goes up in flames kind of thing. So in a way it's not as dramatic, but it is still equally destructive. Which again, being Catholic myself is like an interesting then thing to read. If you're a Catholic and you want a trip about whether you're gonna go to hell or not. Read Joyce Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. I promise you like this will like fuck with you. So, that's it. I just think Sebastian really deserved better. Those are the books that I read in 2019. My goal for 2020 is 20 books. If you have any recommendation things I should read, let me know down below. I'll of course link my Goodreads as always. But yeah, like to grab another jazz and I'll see you guys 
very, very soon. Like, oh, oh dear. Oh, I can't reach it. It's too far. Okay.